Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we take a look at the role of government in the First World War. We hear now from Dr Edward Madigan about how the First World War was seen by many at the time as a profoundly moral war and the role the churches played in creating that perception. I'm Edward Madigan. I'm a historian based at Royal Holloway at the University of London. My main interests are in the British and Irish experience and memory of the First World War. I've always been fascinated in the way people experienced the Great War and in the ways in which they remembered that experience afterwards. Then more recently, I've been involved in and interested in the commemoration of war in these islands and across Europe more generally. One of the things that I found challenging during the centenaries of the First World War in talking to students and to the public about the way the war was experienced is talking about the morality of the First World War. Part of the reason that's challenging is because we tend to look at the experience of the First World War backwards through the prism of the Second World War. And very many of us, understandably, look at the Second World War as a morally clear-cut conflict. Nazism was a self-evident evil that simply had to be defeated. And the end result of the war, the defeat of the Nazi state and Imperial Japan and fascist Italy, these were good things. When we look back at the First World War, there tends to be this feeling that it's a lot more morally ambiguous. All of the states drifted into it, and the soldiers on both sides were victims of an extraordinary process of industrialized violence and killing. It seems, certainly in the popular memory since the 60s, something close to a futile war. At least it's hard to work out what was it about, what did it achieve? One of the things I've been trying to impress upon people is that however we feel about it today, for many people at the time, this was a profoundly moral war. Believing in the righteousness and the justice of the war was especially important in the United Kingdom. Britain was slightly different to some of the other states that went to war in 1914. Britain had no mass standing army. It had no system of conscription. British territory was not invaded in 1914. In the summer of 1914, Belgium was overrun by the largest invasion force ever assembled. Northeastern France, of course, was invaded. And although we tend to forget this in Britain, Germany was invaded too by the Russians and East Prussia was occupied for two months. So the British state had to persuade people to go to war and make extraordinary sacrifices, even though national territory hadn't been invaded and was under no realistic threat of invasion. And they couldn't legally require them to fight as they could in France and Germany and Russia and most of the other belligerent states. So what we see happening in Britain is this very powerful form of cultural mobilization, persuading people that the war is worth fighting and worth winning and that the British cause is just. Propaganda suggests that the state is lying to the people and forcing them to do things that they wouldn't do if they were better appraised of the facts. But actually, the selling of the war, the presentation of the war, is something that people get involved in at all levels in society, not just the government. So we have journalists, clergymen, crucially, which I'll come back to, trade unionists, all sorts of civic leaders telling people, you must get involved. This is a morally righteous war. The Allied cause is just. Now, the clergy, not just the clergy of the main established Church of England and in Scotland, the Presbyterian Church, but the clergy across Britain and Ireland are very much involved in that process from the outset. Clergymen traditionally have been self-proclaimed moral arbiters. So very naturally, clergymen weighed in at the outset. They had a public platform. They had the pulpits of the nation's churches, the nation's synagogues throughout Britain and Ireland. Anglicans are in the majority simply because English people are in the majority. But in each constituent nation, England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland, you have a different majority faith. Anglicanism in England, Methodism in Wales, Presbyterianism in Scotland and Catholicism in Ireland. Then you have this huge and wonderfully colourful range of smaller Protestant sects. You have a very significant Jewish minority and a small but not insignificant Muslim community as well. 
What's striking, however, is despite this great diversity, there's a remarkably uniform church response to the war. And it's one of overwhelming support in 1914. We see the clergy of both the Church of England and the Church of Scotland, but also the non-conformist clergy who traditionally keep the state at arm's length. The Catholic clergy, who at least in Ireland represent people who have often a very antagonistic relationship with the British state, getting very much behind the war effort, encouraging people to believe in the war, to believe in British war aims, and crucially, encouraging young men to join the armed forces. There are some dissenting voices. A few brave souls who are prepared to go very much against the tide of public opinion within the church and within the lay communities of the churches. But really, there are a handful of these people in 1914. If we take the example of the British Society of Friends, the Quakers, which traditionally is the most pacifist of the religious institutions in Britain and Ireland, they're definitely ambivalent about the war at the outset. There's a sense that the British cause is probably an honourable one, but war can never be religiously endorsed. And they make a rather principled stance, but this is quite a small community. And ultimately, thousands of men of military age who were Quakers were involved in the war effort as ambulance drivers and in a surprising number of cases as combatants. So what we see in Britain and Ireland in 1914 and continuing on then into 15 and 16 is the clergy playing a really prominent role in cultural mobilisation. They're involved in recruitment. They endorse the war effort quite formally in some cases. And although what they say about the war varies to some degree and some of it's quite extreme, there's a general support. It's worth highlighting some of those more extreme cases because they give us an idea of just how intense and passionate feelings were, particularly in the first year or two of the war. One of the more strident clerical supporters of the war was a man called Arthur Foley Winnington Ingram. Winnington Ingram was the Bishop of London throughout the war years. He had been consecrated in 1904, so he'd been bishop for about 10 years before the outbreak of the war. It's worth remembering that a hundred years ago, a lot of these very senior Church of England clergymen especially were very well-known figures. The Bishop of London, Winnington Ingram, was probably one of the more popular preachers in the country during this time. He would have been very well-known across Britain and indeed to a degree in Ireland. Certainly for Londoners, he was the public face of the church. He was very sympathetic towards Germany and the German people before the war broke out. After he'd finished his education in England, he'd spent about 18 months in Heidelberg as a young man in the late 19th century. And in a speech he gave to a delegation of German theologians and clergymen who came over to London before the war in 1908, he gave an extraordinarily warm and welcoming account of Anglo-German relations, referred to the Germans as our brothers by culture and said something like, we all love Germany and the Germans. He could more or less have worked for the German Tourist Board before the war. In the very immediate aftermath of the outbreak of the war, he's quite restrained. He said, we have to remember that we're at war with Prussian militarism, with the Kaiser, with the German military, but not with the German people. Over the next year or so, however, his attitude really hardens and he becomes one of the more strident anti-German voices of the war. Towards the end of 1915, it's the first Sunday of Advent, he gives this sermon in Westminster Abbey, which I've referred to, and I think accurately, as the most inflammatory sermon of the war years. A lot of the sermon actually deals with missionary work, but he digresses at one point and refers to the war as a great crusade. To save the freedom of the world, to save liberty's own self, to save the honour of men and women and the innocence of children, everything that is noblest in Europe, Everyone that puts principle above ease and life itself beyond mere living are banded in a great crusade. We cannot deny it. To kill Germans. To kill them, not for the sake of killing, but to save the world. To kill the good as well as the bad. To kill the young men as well as the old. To kill those who have shown kindness to our wounded, as well as those fiends who crucified the Canadian sergeant, who superintended the Armenian massacres who sank the Lusitania and who turned the machine guns on the civilians of Ershot and Louvain, and to kill them lest the civilization of the world itself be killed. Now, 
Had these words been uttered by a more junior clergyman, they mightn't take on the same significance. But as Bishop of London, Willington Ingram was the third most senior clergyman in the Church of England, and he'd been this very public figure for years before the war. To us in the 21st century, that seems so extreme. Kill Germans, kill the old, kill the young. But if we put it in context, I don't think it explains it or justifies it, but it becomes somewhat more understandable. The behaviour of the German armed forces from the very beginning of the war in August 1914 was absolutely central to the way people understood the war and the morality of the war in Britain and Ireland. This cultural mobilisation I've talked about depends upon this vision of the German enemy as a force of malevolent depravity that simply has to be stopped. In the first six weeks of the war, German soldiers in the invasion force in Belgium and France commit terrible atrocities. They kill approximately 6,000 civilians hors de combat, so outside the circumstances of combat. They put them up against the wall, they shoot them, and they kill mayors and dignitaries, they kill ordinary civilians, and they cause millions of francs worth of damage to property. This stuff is very widely reported in Britain, largely accurately. Some of it is embellishment and some of it's downright lies, but there's a strong degree of truth in it. One incident in particular, the sacking of Louvain, the Belgian town on the 25th of August 1914, is widely reported. So that's something that can't be denied. That gives a real moral fervour to the case for war in Britain and Ireland. It allows the clergy, and indeed journalists and others, but particularly the clergy, to present the war to the public in robustly moral terms. This is a great crusade. As the war goes on, into 1915, British and Irish civilians start to become the victims of German military aggression in the U-boat campaigns and the airship raids that begin early in 1915 and continue for the rest of the war. When British and Irish civilians start dying, then it becomes all the more personal and the moral case for war and the moral fervour about the war is reinforced. Incidents such as the sinking of the Lusitania in May 1915 and the execution of nurse Edith Cavill in October 1915, these are seen as yet more evidence of this great moral depravity, the great evil of the German enemy. What happens then, coming into 1916 and 17, is the clergy begin to lose a certain amount of their credibility because under the terms of the Military Service Act, under which men are conscripted across Britain, not in Ireland, but in Britain in 1916, the clergymen of all denominations are exempt from military service. And some denominations, notably for Catholics and Jews and certain types of nonconformists, they'd rather not see their clergymen bearing arms and killing. But for a lot of people, the very men who were so staunchly pro-war and vocally encouraging the young men of Britain to go and risk their lives on the Western Front and elsewhere, being sheltered from that experience themselves, it's regarded as hypocritical on the part of the clergy. And when the death tolls on the fighting fronts really become quite extreme, after the Somme Offensive in the summer of 1916, Third Ypres, in the summer of 1917, and a whole host of other very big and costly battles, the position of the clergy really comes to be criticised by working class people and from within the church itself. One of the groups that's very critical of the Church of England leadership are Church of England chaplains who are serving on the Western Front. These are junior clergymen, the vicars and curates of Britain and Ireland who are serving in uniform as chaplains. They're living with combatant officers and men. They often do endure risk. They experience enemy fire. They go into the front line. They see that the position of the church at home is really compromising their position at the front. That's more of an acute problem for the Anglican clergy than it is for the Catholic clergy. And my understanding is that it's less of an issue for the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, partly because proportionately more Church of Scotland clergy are prepared to serve as combatants. There's less of a cultural ban on that in the Church of Scotland than there is in the Church of England. The position of the Church of England for most of the war is that the role of an ordained clergyman is incompatible with the role of a combatant. They can serve as chaplains, they can serve in the Royal Army Medical Corps, but they shouldn't bear arms. A couple of hundred of them do that anyway, but there's about 25,000 Anglican clergy in Britain and Ireland during the First World War. If you're a family 
working class or middle class or upper class and three sons and maybe a father and friends have all gone to the front and you feel like you're making extraordinary sacrifices, you're going to start to feel pretty resentful and maybe a bit embittered about groups or individuals who aren't making sacrifices. And increasingly, towards the end of the war, the clergy are identified as one of the groups that isn't perhaps doing all that it could be doing. By the end of the war, the clergy in general, and I would say the Church of England clergy in particular, have come under quite a bit of fire. There's also been quite a lot of praise. Three Anglican army chaplains have been awarded Victoria Crosses. Over 200 received military crosses. The clergy of various different denominations were recognized for their war work and were quite popular within their communities and performed very important work on the home front. In 1919, 1920 and into the interwar period, in the commemorative culture that emerges in Britain and significantly less in Ireland, the churches and the clergy play a crucial role. Even some of the people who are quite disappointed or even angry with the clergy during the course of the war, their mode for remembering, the places in which they remember, these are the churches, the cemeteries, the places that are sanctified, the natural space of the clergy. So the church membership and church going doesn't decline in the post-war years. If anything, it slightly increases. And that includes for the Church of England. I think there's a great desire across Britain into the 1920s for a degree of stability, a degree of calm, and also for the traditional world that they perceive as having been lost forever, the pre-1914 world, which actually in lots of ways was quite divided and quite chaotic. But the war was so traumatic for so many people that there's a great desire for a return to tradition. Church going is part of that desire for a return to order in the post-war world. One of the great symbols of post-war commemoration, the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior, that's conceived of by an Anglican army chaplain, David Railton. The warrior himself is, of course, laid to rest in Westminster Abbey, which in a sense is the parish church of the British Empire. Part of the reason why the Church of England as an institution were so keen to embrace Reverend Railton's idea was that they were a little bit put out by the unveiling of the Cenotaph and the extraordinary popularity of the Cenotaph in 1919 and then when it's made permanent in 1920 because it's deliberately non-religious. Lutyens, in his design of it, wanted it to be not specifically Christian and he also wanted it to be as plain as possible so people could impose their own meaning on it. So the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior was a means of the church resting back what it felt was its rightful role in national mourning, national commemoration and national memory of the dead. That was Dr Edward Madigan on how the First World War was seen by many at the time as a profoundly moral war and the role the churches played in creating that perception. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. Do join us for our next set of podcasts when we look at iron and steel, agriculture, forestry, fisheries and the role of scientists during the First World War.